This is Michael Borenstein, and I'm standing in front of my office with today's lecture on power analysis for, for cluster randomized and multi-site studies. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the effect size and how we set that in a power analysis. The issues that I'm going to be discussing here are applied to a power analysis for a simple randomized trial, as well as for cluster randomized trials, but I think um, this is something that uh, people are not always very clear about, and it might help to go over it. Let me set this up as a relatively simple two-level trial, uh, where we have uh, students and then um, schools within students. Again, to put those names in, we simply right-click over here. I type schools for the cluster level, students for the individual level, click OK. And uh, let's say initially we're going to set the effect size as point, um, point 0.4. Again, you can right-click over here, and then you have the option of modifying the effect size in increments of point 0.1 or point 0.01 which is generally going to be enough, but you could even change it by something more uh, like 0.001 if you wanted to. I'm going to work with 0.1, and we'll set the effect size as 0.4. And then we can go ahead and come up with a, a reasonable combination of numbers that's going to give us uh, power, let's say, of 80%. So we set this, first of all, at 80% over here. Um, we set the ICC, let's say, at point. Two. Uh, let's forget about the covariates for now. Let's assume that the model is random at both levels. And let's put the cost at $2,000 for every school that we plan to enroll. And then once we've enrolled the school, let's say that every student that we put into the study is going to cost us $100. And we ask the program to find the uh, optimal combination of uh, schools to students, the optimal ratio, I click the optimal design wizard. I leave both of these at find the number. I click compute. And the program tells me that I can come up with a study that's going to give me power of 80% at a cost of $172,000. We're going to have 32 schools and 7 students per school. And I click paste to put those numbers up here. I click close. And the program shows me that now I have 80% power at a cost of $172,800. Now notice, by the way, that if I was going to try to manipulate this myself, I can't bring the number of schools down below 32 because that would bring power below 80%. I can't bring the number of students below 7 because that's going to bring power below 80%. What I could do is I could bump up, let's say, the number of students, let's say, to 10 and then I could reduce the number of schools to 29, but the power is going to be 174, I'm sorry, the cost is going to be $174,000, whereas the other way the cost was $172,000. So what the program did was it gave me the most cost-effective solution. On the other hand, if I decided that I wanted to have a few more um, students per school and bring down the number of schools, that might be an option, and it might not be a lot more expensive. And we'll come back to that in a little while and see how we could um, how we can find that. But for the time being, as I said, um, I want to focus on the effect size. Now, what this tells me is that if the true effect is actually 0.4, then I have an 80% chance of, um, of getting statistical significance. Now, one key idea that I mentioned in, in the materials and that I want to emphasize over here is that power analysis is, is not a question of what, what is the power. Um, it, it's more a question of what is the power if this is true, or this is true, or this is true. So for example, we don't know that the true effect size is 0.4. If we knew that the true effect size was 0.4, there wouldn't be any need to do a study to prove that the true effect size is non-zero. I mean, the whole idea would be, um, would be silly. The point is we're saying, what if the true effect size is 0.4? Then what would be my power to prove that the null hypothesis is false? It's also possible that the true effect size is 0.5, and it's possible that the true effect size is 0.3, and certainly outside that range as well. If 
we work with an effect size of 0.4 and if the actual effect size is 0.3 what's going to happen well let's move this down to 0.3 in that case our power wouldn't be 80 percent it would be 55 percent so we'd have only a slightly better than chance possibility probability of getting a statistically significant effect on the other hand if the effect size is actually 0.5 then power would be 93 which means that we have a better than 90 percent chance of getting a significant effect when it come, we come back over here we can put in 0.5 as the value we can put in 0.4 as the value we can put in 0.3 as the value whatever we power the study for if the true effect size is actually higher then our actual power is going to be higher than that if on the other hand the true effect size is actually lower then our power is going to be lower than that by setting the effect size at 0.4 we're saying well you know if the effect size is actually 0.4 then this intervention is important enough that um, we want to be reasonably sure we're going to get a significant effect and we're 80 percent likely to get a significant effect so that's okay on the other hand if we set the the effect size at 0.4 what we're also saying by implicitly if not explicitly is that you know if the actual effect size is really 0.3 then we only have a 55 percent chance of getting statistical significance but that's okay because an intervention uh, with an effect size of 0.3 is not that important that we really need to know about it if we miss that intervention then then we can live with that um, tip I mean if that's the analysis that you that that you're able to make is you have to make that analysis at some point if you set the the effect size at 0.3 and power for that and let's see what that would would involve that would involve a study that costs three hundred thousand dollars so it's it's about one hundred and twenty thousand more than your study and we pass those numbers then okay now we have good power uh, if the true effect size is 0 0.3 but if the effect size is 0 0.2 then our power is only 46 percent so the point is at some point we always have to make that judgment that this is the effect size that we care about and if the effect size if the true effect size is smaller than this then you know it would be nice to get statistical significance but we're willing to take the risk that we won't so we always have to make that decision and this is it's, it's always a question of balance the smaller the effect size that you put in here the more likely it is that you're going to get statistical significance regardless of what the true effect size is but on the other hand the more the study is going to cost you so it's always a question of, of, of finding a balance and what I always emphasize for people writing grant applications is that you can't say the true effect size is 0.4 and therefore our power is 80 percent or the true effect size is 0.3 and therefore our power is 80 percent what you need to say is we don't know what the true effect size is but we consider an effect size of 0.4 large enough that it's important that if that's the true effect size that we're able to disprove the null so if the true effect size is 0.4 then our power is 80 percent or if the true effect size is 0.3 then our power is 80 percent if the true effect size is actually larger than the number we put in here then our power is going to be greater than 80 percent and if the true effect size is actually smaller than the number we put in here then the power is going to be less than 80 percent and just to be clear I'm using 80 percent as an example uh, as a general rule I don't think there's any reason to pick 80 percent well um, it, it might make more sense to pick 90 percent uh, in some cases but again that's a balance and we can talk about that a little bit later on coming back to effect sizes though we can we can do it this way we can manipulate continually manipulate the effect size over here see what the cost is and come up with some kind of a balance but a much easier way to do this is simply to use the graph I'm gonna leave the effect size right now at 0.3 it really doesn't matter a lot um, or actually let me bring it back to 0.4 because that's the number that we started with use the optimal design wizard click compute we're coming up with paste close so we're coming up with 32 schools seven students per school now I'm gonna click graph and what the program does is it immediately creates a graph based on all the numbers we have on the main screen so we have a two-level cluster design schools are randomized students are nested within schools we're testing the difference in means the statistical model is random at both random effects at both levels the effect size is a standardized mean difference of 0 
The number of schools varies. It goes here from 10 to 100. The ICC has been set at 0.2. There are no covariates. And the students are seven per group per school. And again, there are no covariates for students. Just to make this a little bit easier to work with, I'm going to get rid of this caption down here by clicking um, on the word footer. So now I simply have more real estate. It's easier to see what I'm doing. And what you can see over here for this fairly simple graph is that this is what we saw on the main screen. If we click over here with 30, and we actually can get the precise details, we have 32 schools, which you can see down here, 32 schools per condition. The cost is going to be $172,000. And this uh, line, as we saw a minute ago on the caption, is for a D value of 0.4. We want to say now, well, what if the D value was 0.3 or 0.5? How would that affect the power. We can come over here, we click on series, um, and we're going to add the D value as the series. We're going to click add to add one more value. The first one was 0.4. We're going to add 0.5 and 0.3 and click OK. And now we have down here, we have the uh, the legend the top one is 0.5, the middle one is 0.4, and the bottom one is 0.3. You'll notice that the program has automatically re-sorted them. And now, uh, 0.4 is the one we were looking at a minute ago. And if we want to see what number we need to get power of 80% with 0.4, we can simply click over here and drag this. And as we do, this is going to move up towards 80%. And we're back to the place where we have 32 schools per group gives us power of 80 percent. Notice by the way that you can also manipulate this by moving these arrows over here. It goes up, it goes down, and to jump between these lines you can simply click on this one or you can use the arrows that go up and down to move between the lines while keeping the number of schools constant. So that's just a couple of ways to work this fairly easily. What we can see over here is that we're if we're powering for an effect size of 0.4 and the actual effect size is 0.3 and again to see what the power is over here and without having to be very careful about where you click we're just going to click the down arrow we see that power goes down to 55 percent on the other hand if the effect size is actually 0.5 power goes up to 94 percent so if we are working with an effect size of 0.4 we're saying we're, we're pretty much willing to um, uh, ignore the possibility that if the actual effect size is 0.3, there's a pretty good chance we're not going to get statistical significance, but that's okay. We, we can look at it this way and say, well, you know, I, I really do care about an effect size of 0.3, and what would it cost me um, if I wanted to be sure of having 80% power to get, even if the effect size is actually 0.3? So we can come down here, and we can, I just clicked on the light blue line, and we can bring this back until power is 80 percent and what we see is that we would need um, 56 schools per group to get power of 80 percent so with um, and in which case by the way if the actual uh, effect size is 0.4 power would be 96 and if it's actually 0.5 power would be 99 so obviously we're getting you know really good power for both of these and we're getting good power for this. The next question we need to ask though is how much extra is this going to cost? Well one of the nice things about this program is that you can add costs directly to the graph. We're going to click on cost and say show cost in graph. And this line over here represents the cost in thousands of dollars. This legend over here corresponds to this and the, this legend over here corresponds to um, these lines. You'll notice that the cost is linear. These lines are curvilinear because as you add additional schools, the power does not go up in a, it goes up in a monotonic fashion, but not in a linear fashion. Whereas cost for every additional school that you add, the cost goes up by a fixed amount. And what we can see is that if we're powering to get power of 80% for an effect size of 0.3, this is going to cost us $300,000, whereas if we are powering to get 80% power for an effect size of 0 
the cost is going to be only one hundred seventy-two thousand, only one hundred seventy-two thousand dollars. And if we're powering to get eighty percent power for an effect size of 0.5, um, then power is going to the cost is going to be one hundred thirteen thousand dollars. So by adding this line to the graph. Um, we're no longer simply talking about the number of schools that we need, but we're also talking about how much money we need to spend. So this kind of a graph where we're looking at three effect sizes simultaneously does two things. One thing is it, also, it actually shows you the, the curvature of this. As you've noticed, for example, it's pretty clear in, in, in these two cases, the curve is not linear. That as you move within this, let's say from here to here, that every additional school gives you something of an increase in power. Whereas once you get past that, you know, somebody might say, well, why use only, um, let, let's say we're, we're powering for an effect size of 0.4, and we see that with 60 cases we get 97% power. And this is a really important intervention. We want to be very sure of having adequate statistical power. And somebody might say, well, why not bring it up, you know, past this, the 70 or 80 or 90? You can see very clearly that the added impact at least of increasing the number of schools is going to be trivial, so that's probably not a good thing to do. Um, whereas if you're down here working with this effect size, then that might actually make sense. The nice idea of a graph is always is that it puts all of these things in context for you. Um, the next thing that you might want to do is create a table from this information. If you're working as part of a team, which hopefully you are, um, you need to bring this information back and, and review it with your colleagues so that, because we're talking here about which of these do we want to use as the effect size, um, what power do we want, how much is it going to cost. Typically, these are the kinds of things that you're going to be discussing as part of a group. Well, one thing that you want to do is take this whole graph over here and put it into PowerPoint. So let's say File, Save Graph as JPEG formatted for PowerPoint. I just click on that and it asks me for a name for this. I'm going to call this, uh, let's say, Griff01, and I'm saving it to my desktop. And then I can open up a copy of PowerPoint, and I can say Insert Home, it's a new slide, which is blank, and I'm going to insert a picture, which is coming from my desktop, and which is graph 01. And there, and then I click F5 to run this, right? And so inside PowerPoint, I have this, um, this graph, which we can discuss. Um, you also obviously can go back and do that with all of the um, captions intact. Uh, or you can you can take the captions and export them to a text file and then insert them into PowerPoint manually. But those are relatively uh, trivial details. Coming back here is something that you might want to do is put this into a table and you might want to export this information to Excel. Come over here, say File, Save Table, and Open in Excel. Before I even do that, there is an option over here to show this all well, this information as a table. I just click on Show Table, and toggle that on and off. I have a table of power, and this is linked directly to the graph. So, for example, if I come back over here and I click on this number, which was an effect size of D is 0.3 with 32 schools, the program automatically finds the corresponding line over here. The effect size is 0.4. 32 schools, power is 0.8022. And if I was to come over here, let's say, and click on this instead, it finds the corresponding number over here. That's a D value of 0.5 with uh, 32 schools. And at the same time, by the way, it's highlighting the, the cost of the study. You'll note that the cost is the same um, for each row within the column because the cost doesn't de de depend on, on the effect size. And then, um, and I think it also works in reverse, so if I click on this, for example, the program uh, keeps up with that, and the, these numbers uh, move along in tandem, which is kind of nice, because I didn't remember that we had done that, but it obviously makes this a little bit easier to use. So you can look at the actual numbers, you can look at the graph. The next thing you might want to do is take the cell table and export it to Excel. 
because maybe you'd like to do some, do some additional some additional manipulation with the numbers or create your own graphs in a format that you feel more comfortable with. I simply click File, Save Table, and Open in Excel. The program asks me a name for the table. I'm going to call it Table 1, Table 01, Table 01. And then the program opens up Excel. And within Excel, I now have the same table that we saw a minute ago. Power is a function of the number of schools and the standardized difference D. Here's the standardized difference, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3. This is a table of power. This is the number of schools per condition. This is basically the same thing that we saw a minute ago, except that now you have it in Excel. And you can go ahead and do whatever you want to as far as making up new graphs and so on. Okay, so that's a way of dealing with uh, the effect size. I try to show you that the effect size is not, should not be referred to as the true effect size, but if the effect size is this, then this is what power is going to be. And we're always trying to strike a balance. I mean, in some ways it would be nice to power this for an effect size of 0.1, but doing that, in some cases that might actually make sense, but doing that is going to be pretty expensive. Um, on the other hand, we don't want to use an effect size which is unrealistically large because any effect size smaller than that, for, for any effect size smaller than that, the, the study is going to be underpowered. And then I showed you how to use the graph so that you can look at these different effect sizes in relation to each other. You can see what the cost is. So you can put all of this in context. Uh, but the things that I showed you about the graph for effect size also apply to other parameters as we'll see in a, um, in a little while. I'd like to go back and make one more point about the effect size. Um, what people often do when they are trying to pick an effect size is they'll go back to an earlier study and say, well, that study had an effect size of 0.3 or 0.4 or whatever it might have been. Therefore, that's the effect size that I'm going to use in my study. That is not the way that you should be choosing an effect size for two reasons. Um, the first reason is that the effect size in the prior study is, there, there's no reason to think that that is the true effect size. A, again, to reiterate a point that I made earlier, if we knew what the effect size was, there wouldn't be any need to do the study. I mean, the whole reason that we do statistical testing is that we're taking a look at the effect size that we got in the study and asking if we can reasonably conclude that the true effect size is not zero. We're not trying to conclude that the true effect size is the effect size that we saw in an earlier study. The second reason is that it sort of, it misses the whole idea of what a power analysis is meant to do. What we're trying to do in a power analysis is to say, well, if the actual effect size is this, then the importance of that intervention would be so great that we want to be at least 80% certain that we're going to reject the null. Or we want to be at least 90% certain that we're going to reject the null. The effect size seen in that way is a hypothetical number. It's the number that we are concluding would be an important effect size. And what that is depends on the context of your study. If you're dealing with, with mortality, if you're looking at a treatment which might reduce the risk of death, then probably even a fairly small difference in the risk of death is going to be very important. If we're dealing with an intervention that's going to keep kids from dropping out of school, even a, you know, a, a small impact might be important, but it depends on the context. If there are other interventions which can reduce the risk of, of kids dropping out of school by, by, um, by, by 10%, um, and your intervention is more expensive than those, then it's probably only going to be worthwhile if it can reduce the risk of kids dropping out of school by 15% or 20%. If we're working with means, I guess I should use an example for means over here. If there are other interventions that can improve uh, kids' scores on the SAT by 30 points and that are reasonably inexpensive to implement, then this new treatment might be uh, useful if it can re if it can increase scores also by 30 points but that is even cheaper and easier to implement or if it can increase their scores by 50 points and is only a little bit more expensive to implement the point is we're trying to find something that would be important 
either because it, it, it is as good as other interventions but less expensive, or better than, under, than other interventions and equally expensive, or a lot better than other interventions and only modestly more expensive. So where do prior studies fit into this? Well, they fit in in the sense that they give you context. Uh, let's say that other studies have found that you know interventions of this kind can increase scores by, by 30 points. And you're saying, well, my intervention is going to increase the scores by 50 points. The prior studies let you know whether or not your expectations are realistic. You know, if 10 or 20 people have come up with comparable interventions and all of them seem to increase scores by something in the range of 10, 20, 30 points, it probably is not realistic to think that yours is going to increase scores by 50 points, unless it's really some kind of a brand new thing. So that's where other studies are important. They let you know whether or not your expectations are plausible. But what you don't want to do, uh, I guess to, to just beat up this, this point one more time, is to say that study had an effect of 30 points, therefore that's the true effect, because that sort of misses the whole point of, of what the power analysis is trying to do.